here? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, sir. It's really nice to, to be here, and I appreciate the, the invitation. This is a great honor for me, and thank you all for, for coming here. Um, what I wanted to talk about is how we progressives can win the argument and the election in 2020. In their most recent book, Daron Asimoglu and James Robinson suggested that nations with healthy social, political, and economic norms occupy an historically narrow corridor, bordered on both sides by nations that do not have those healthy norms and behaviors. On the one side are the Orwellian states with authoritarian regimes, and in those states, possibly after a brief phase of euphoria and hope, oppression is the political norm. Economic interactions are quashed by bureaucratic restraints, and social relations are dulled by anomy, alienation, a pervasive lack of hope, and sometimes even fear. One thinks of Stalin's Soviet Union, Hitler's Nazi Germany, Mugabe's Zimbabwe, Salazar's Portugal, or Kim Jong-un's North Korea. On the other side of this narrow corridor lie the equally dysfunctional nations with an almost Tobesian lack of any order at all. Economic interactions are discouraged by things like a lack of reasonable regulations, fair conventions, or consistent laws, a scarcity of basic public goods, like a legal system, transportation or communications infrastructure. And except for a few and often restrictive habits and norms, the lack of social traditions capable of sustaining the basic requirements of life within the narrow corridor, those don't exist. Northwest Pakistan, much of modern day Afghanistan, large swaths of modern Sudan are exemplars of the nations on this side of the narrow corridor. The point Asimoglu and Robinson make is that states within this corridor are those that are neither authoritarian nor anarchic. Instead, they countenance, the, again, the one, the states within this corridor, they countenance and even encourage competition innovation, creative destruction, heterodoxy, and even, at times, disruption. While at the same time they maintain enough predictability, order, and stability to allow their <coughs> citizens to leave lives of opportunity, hope, and optimism. Their book presents a good heuristic model for the ideal state. But the book does not, however, offer any theory as to precisely how that ideal state might be achieved. So in the next few minutes, I'd like to suggest such a theory. I'm going to argue that implementing the progressive agenda is the surest route to an existence within that narrow corridor. I'm going to acknowledge, on the other hand, that implementing the progressive agenda is a Herculean challenge. I'll suggest, nevertheless, that it is possible. Moreover, I will argue that failure to implement it will lead to a dark future that keeps us outside of Asimoglu's and Robinson's narrow corridor. So first, let me start with a little background about myself. I'm governor of Pennsylvania, and I'm a progressive Democrat. Pennsylvania is an eastern state. I know all of you saw that it was a Midwestern state. It's an eastern state. We were one of the original 13 colonies. Uh, but we are wedged between our better known neighbor to the north, New York State, <coughs> and its internationally famous neighbor to the south, Washington, DC. But on its own, Pennsylvania is a big deal. Its GDP in 2018, was $789 billion, which would make it one of the largest economies in the world if it were an independent country. Uh, Pennsylvania has two world-class cities, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And much that has happened in the political, social, and economic history of the United States is actually run through Pennsylvania. It's a crucial state in any national election because it's big and because it can be changed. In the 2016 presidential election, as you all know, Donald Trump won Pennsylvania. He won it by 44,000 votes. In 2018, two years later, I won my re-election race for governor by 750,000 votes. So in the next few minutes, I want to talk about what I think we progressives need to do based on my experience to win in places like Pennsylvania. And in many ways, Pennsylvania is a good place to model political behaviors and outcomes. It's a large, urban uh, uh, and suburban state. It has a big urban and suburban population. And in Pennsylvania, those populations look much like the suburban and urban populations around the country. Its rural population in Pennsylvania has one of the largest rural populations in the United States, acts and votes much like the rural populations in other parts of the country. So convincing Pennsylvanians of the virtues of the progressive agenda is most likely what it's gonna take to convince the broader US population uh, of its virtues. In other words, if we can sell Pennsylvania on progressivism, we can sell anybody. S 
Still, it's going to be hard. While we progressives have tried to win the argument amongst ourselves as to which shade of progressivism is most worthy, we actually lost the argument with the people we fervently believe the progressive agenda can help the most. What's more, we've lost the argument to those who are peddling the very policies that we believe will hurt the people to whom they're appealing. I come to this task as, I, as indeed I came to politics five years ago with a very unique perspective. And that perspective is founded on three distinct strands in my professional life. I have spent time as an academic, I've spent time as a business owner, and for the last five years, again, I've been a politician. The first two experiences have informed the last. Because of them, I appreciate the need to invest the design of any product or service or idea with intellectual rigor. But these experiences have also led me to understand that this product, service, or idea must also be capable of being sold. A product, service, or idea that is the result of sloppy thinking is not going to do anyone any good. But neither is a great product, service, or idea that no one needs, no one can sell, or no one wants to buy. It reminds me of when I used to sell roofing products, okay? When I started in business in the United States, there were three grades of shingles. Just bear with me here. <laughs> the least expensive was, and this is when I started, it's, it's different now, but when I started, there was the, the least expensive came with a 15-year guarantee. The next most expensive came with a 20-year guarantee, and the third and most expensive per 100 square feet of coverage came with a 25-year guarantee. Now, selling these, bear with me, selling these on first blush was really easy. You sold on price. In other words, you push the 15-year shingles. And any time you advertise this in the newspaper or wherever, you advertise the 15-year shingle because that was the price point. And in some cases, for example, where a homeowner had a short time horizon, the cheapest product actually was the most appropriate product. But in most cases, it turned out, the best deal was in the more expensive lines because on a cost per 100 square feet per year basis, they were the least expensive. This was because on a cost per year basis, the more expensive shingles were actually less expensive per year, the 25 years. But it was also because installing 15-year shingles, if you were going to live in the house for more than 15 years, meant that you were going to have to change, uh, put a new roof on at least some point in the middle of that, that uh, time that you were living in the house. So the key was to make sure, through good questions, some probing, and ultimately an appeal to reason and self-interest, that you were connecting the customer to the shingle that she really needed. The same is true of the progressive agenda. We have a superior set of policy ideas for anyone thinking in the long run. The problem is that we're not doing a very good job of convincing the electorate that these ideas are, in fact, superior. The other side is having a field day selling the electorate on ideas that, while they're clearly seductive, aren't going to do them much good. They're selling 15-year shingles to an electorate that's going to stay in their house for more than 25 years. Instead of promoting policies that would make democracy and the free market work, for example, they peddle flashy ideas based on things like division, hatred, exclusion, and xenophobia that won't do anything but speed our journey out of the narrow corridor and make the lives of most Americans much worse. They promote things like gerrymandering that allows those po same politicians to figure out uh, who their constituents are going to be. They sell voter suppression techniques to keep people who might not support them from voting. They push for policies that lead to the maldistribution of wealth, which distorts market behavior and thwarts opportunity. They suppress competition by allowing the market to be increasingly dominated by a smaller and smaller list of bigger and bigger corporations. They sell shoddy products and they sell them on price. We constantly miss the chance to upsell our fellow citizens on the progressive agenda. And that's a problem. So how should we approach this upsell opportunity? There are five things we ought to do. And let me start with the first of these, which is the agenda itself. That agenda has a lot of good features and benefits. The progressive agenda promotes a level playing field through non-discrimination policies aimed at countering behaviors and eliminating laws that exclude people. The same is true of the uh, pro progressive agenda when we uh, think about uh, the uh, uh, other things that, that go into it. Progressive agenda specifically promotes policies that ensure that women are free to make their own health care decisions. It calls for economic policies that increase competitiveness and has strong antitrust laws. 
that set appropriate minimum wages that ensure workplace safety and facilitate market, market integration. It calls for policies and erects institutions that protect workers' rights to organize. It encompasses immigration policies that allow for workforce growth. The progressive agenda includes tax policies that encourage innovation and work, and at the same time discourage distortions in the distri distribution of income and wealth, for example, through progressive income taxes and steeply progressive inheritance taxes. The progressive agenda encourages political fairness by promoting fair and free elections, accessible citizenship, fair voting maps, campaign finance reform, and other measures of public integrity. The progressive agenda includes policies that ensure judicial fairness in things like incarceration, probation, bail, and market fairness, for example, consumer protection laws and truth in advertising. The progressive agenda recognizes the need for public goods, a functional society, and a dynamic economy needs, like a strong and effective accessible education system one that provides citizens at all ages with the skills they need and the knowledge they need that's relevant to a 21st century economy, and one that is equitably and adequately funded. It also includes the kinds of connective tissue a modern political economy and a healthy society requires, like good transportation, including mass transit, robust communications, and clean and abundant power. The progressive agenda works to ensure environmental justice <laughs> through appropriate regulations and appropriate externality pricing. It offers a reasonable social safety net, including universal health care and free child care. And it encourages family-friendly policies in the workplace. The goal must be to ensure that the political agenda contains the policies that places us squarely in that narrow corridor. I would argue that the progressive agenda does just that. The second element of the progressive agenda, the sales strategy, has to do with confidence. We progressive have progressives must be confident that these policies are not only morally right, they are, but that they're also practically smart, that the electorate actually needs the 25-year shingles. My background has led me to understand that progressive policies really do improve the quality of life for a nation. And this gives me an extra edge in promoting these policies. For example, most progressives in the United States spent a great deal of time proposing, proposing various schemes aimed at giving Americans fuller access to health care. I support universal health care, not simply because it's morally right, but because offering it would make my life better along with the lives of almost all other Americans. I know this because of something that happened to me at my company. A number of years ago, I was walking through one of my facilities some, uh, when an employee came screaming up to me in a forklift. He jumped off the vehicle and poked me in the chest with his finger and said, I hate our health insurance policy. So as you know, health insurance in the United States is for the most part provided by employers. The United States does not have a national health plan unless you consider the emergency room a health plan. Our company policy was actually among the best. Our health insurance program was free to all employees it provided full family coverage, gave our employees the option of getting their health care from any place of their choosing. So I was puzzled. I said, all right, I'm, being, I'm game. What is it you don't like about our health insurance program? And he started laughing. He said, nothing. He said, it's a great plan, and that's the problem. I'm 49 years old. I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my career. So I said, you don't have to. He said, we have a free training program that you can actually, you're forced to be part of, uh, and you can change your career track. He said, it wouldn't work. I don't want to stay in this industry. So I laughed. I said, there's not much I can do then, but for my own edification, what do you want to do? He said, I'd like to be a furniture maker. So I said, well, <laughs> why don't you do that? He said, because I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to get health insurance. I have two children, and I can't afford to risk going without health insurance for a period during which one of them might need serious health care. So as a result of the insecurity caused by lack of access to health care, he was doing something he didn't want to do. I had an employee who wasn't happy, happy doing what he was doing, and all of us were out maybe a good set of furniture. It's called job lock, and it's a problem that affects millions and millions of Americans who are trapped in their jobs simply because of the health insurance policy they're offered where they work. It directly affects millions of Americans, but it diminishes all of our lives. How many jobs, how many new products have we gone without as a result of this job lock? All for the want of universal health care. This makes no practical sense for anybody. 
not for the employee, not for the employer directly affected, but not for the rest of us who suffer the underperformance of our economic system because of job lock. The same is true for many other public policies seemed intrusive by some, but things that would make the market and our democracy work better. For example, non-discrimination would increase the pool of talent for companies looking for good employees. Reproductive choice gives women the ability to participate freely and fully in the social, economic, and political world that would benefit from that participation. A level playing field would encourage more people to compete in the market economy, make it much more dynamic. Criminal justice reform would increase the number of people entering the workforce. And the list goes on and on and on. The point is that these are all things that wouldn't just make things better for a small group of people arbitrarily privileged because of some accident of birth. They would make things better for almost everyone. That's the truth. And while the truth is not a sufficient condition for convincing voters of the worth of a public policy, it certainly is a necessary one. And we who promote such policies should take comfort in that truth. It just might help us do a better job of selling the progressive agenda. Third, we must recognize the centrality of human agency in any effort to promote the progressive agenda. Much of the alienation people feel today stems from the suspicion that they simply don't matter. The goal should be to remind ourselves that while we may labor under a host of inherited habits and norms, nothing in life is in fact written. The historian Jill Lepore makes this point in an article about the broad debate back in the 1930s over the fate of democracy back in those perilous times. She cites the Italian philosopher Benedetto Croce who lamented the fact that too often debates like these tended to ignore the centrality of human action. These were just givens. He called them meteorological questions. What Croce was saying, Lepore suggests, was that political problems are not external forces beyond our control. They are forces within our control. She's right, and so was Croce. And the progressive agenda should rest on this important assumption. It should unambiguously acknowledge that humans are at the heart of the design and running of the institutions they erect to make their lives better. And those institutions are agents of the change that we constantly need. This is especially true when it comes to government int intervening in the free market. The truth is that the free market is anything but free. It is anything but a naturally occurring phenomenon, a creature of invisible hands or self-adjusting equilibria. It's instead a social and political construct, the product of conscious human actions that establish the rules and conven conventions that define it. Fair and competitive political and economic systems do not emerge out of a passive governance structure. They emerge as the result of active government and conscious human actions. And that is what it will take to establish and maintain the rules we need for engaging, exchanging, living, and competing with each other. Fourth, the progressive agenda needs to recognize that the context in which policies are designed and implemented is global. Thus, policies which were formerly premised on an autonomous state must now assume that nations and regions are inter interdependent. For example, environmental policies must recognize the fact that neither our air, nor our water, nor our climate recognize national boundaries. Domestic immigration policy cannot ignore the forces in foreign countries that are impelling people to uproot themselves and migrate. Economic drivers like interest rates are increasingly set by global forces that render national central banks irrelevant. And whether we like it or not, markets are becoming larger, more integrated, and more interdependent. All these things call for a progressive agenda that makes these new global realities both comprehensible and acceptable to the domestic audiences to whom that agenda must inevitably appeal. Finally, this agenda must start, as any political and economic agenda must start, with proponents whom people trust. The purveyors of ideas will not be able to convince people who do not trust those purveyors. In my re-election, for example, many people who had voted for Donald Trump in 2016 voted for me in 2018. I was puzzled by this and so was my campaign team. We did not want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but we were not at all sure why a Trump voter would turn around and support someone who has been labeled the most liberal governor in the United States. We sought the answers through focus groups and surveys, and what we found was that many voters in Pennsylvania were willing to give me a pass on my progressive political views because they trusted me. Trust matters. It invests a politician and a political and economic system with the kind of legitimacy that a dynamic, ever-changing system needs. The point of all this 
is that ensuring that we stay in that narrow corridor described by Asimoglu and Robinson involves reconciling the competing demands that uh, for constant ferment and innovation on the one hand with a human yearning for peace, stability, and hope on the other. It's a narrow corridor. In effect, we need to invest our systems with the attributes that allow us to stay within that narrow corridor. And these attributes grow out of policies that make political and economic systems fairer, freer, and more accountable. Those attributes are reinforced by people who understand the practical import of the policies and ideas they are promoting. Those attributes are enabled by a political and economic process that encompasses human agency and an active government. Those attributes are more likely to exist in a nation that recognizes the global context of the policymaking process. And those attributes depend for their existence on the presence of public servants whom citizens actually trust. That selling people on the long-term benefits of remaining in the narrow corridor when the alternative appeals to resentment, anger, or bigotry are so seductive, this is going to be very difficult, and we can't deny that. We live in an age when too many people seem determined to vote persistently against their self-interest. Tom Frank did a masterful job of exposing this problem in his book a long time ago called What's the Matter with Kansas? Some, like Nicholas Kristof, suggest that voters are not so much attracted by the rantings of modern day political hucksters as they are turned off by what they see as the arrogance of so many progressives. Others like ta Coates suggest that vile instincts like racism are so deeply embedded in so many people that vile messages actually resonate. Nor does it help that the progressive message, no matter how closely it homes to the truth, can be very complicated. It is indeed a hard sell. On the other hand, again, we have the truth, and that's not a bad place to start. The truth is that hatred, resentment, and division are not the foundations of a good society, a healthy economy, or a good life for anyone. The truth is that messy, muddled, diverse, contingent, and free political, social, and economic systems are. The truth is that we would all have a better world if we did the difficult things we need to do in order to stay in the narrow corridor. The truth is that while it's a lot easier to sell 15-year shingles, we'd all be a lot better off with 25-year shingles. And we progressives need to live as well as recognize these truths when we try to convince the American electorate of their virtues this November. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your remarks and for joining us here today. Sure. Just before going into the q and I had a few questions about your address. How would, what would you attribute Trump's success to in 2016? How was it that he won Pennsylvania and marked the fall of the Democratic Blue Wall? That's a great question. I think part of it was a, a, a mistrust on both sides. I mean, Donald Trump was not the, um, the candidate of the establishment Republican Party. Uh, and you could argue that the non-establishment Democrat actually won the, the nomination in 2016. Uh, so people were in a mood to, to uh, I think, throw out the establishment. They didn't trust the, the people who were, who were running uh, e either side. And I think he also gave a, a message that, that was easy. He was selling 15-year shingles. He was selling on price, saying, you know, hatred, resentment. People are out to get you. It's not your fault. Uh, all those things are uh, an easy sell, and I think all those things came together in 2016. And how has what voters are looking for in Pennsylvania changed, if it has at all, since 2016? Well, sort of I was trying to say, I'm, I'm hoping that, that we progressives get our act together and do a better job of actually selling the product that we're selling, which is um, that our society, our economy, our democracy will work a lot better if, if we actually resist the temptations that come from the easy, uh, s the stuff that the hucksters are, are selling right now. And I, I think uh, we need to, to work very hard to, to uh, get the voters to actually trust us. So you spoke a lot about the importance of trust and how that was important in your own reelection. What can the Democratic candidate do this year in order to gain this trust in Pennsylvania? I'm not sure. I, I mean, I, I found, I, I don't, I, and I can afford this, I, I give my salary to charity. I, my wife and I live in our home. Um, I pay my own way on state business. I pay my own way when I come places like this. And I think those things um, uh, people seem to like. Uh, and I'm not saying that every 
public servant should, should do those things. But every public servant should be aware that people are looking at them and saying, you are in a different position than you are as somebody who is selling me shingles. And I'm, I'm gonna judge you differently. Uh, and we need to recognize that. And, and I think too often we don't. And I think whoever the Democratic progressive nominee is, they're gonna have to do whatever they can do to say, you can trust me. Moving to your, to your own election, you were the first challenger to oust a sitting governor. What do you attribute your own campaign's success to? And do you do anything differently from past campaigns that you think stands out? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I was uh, w one of the, the uh, planes from 9-11 actually crashed in Pennsylvania. So every year we have a 9-11 memorial out in western Pennsylvania. And I think the second or third year I went out, Donald Trump and Melania Trump came. So there were a lot of the red MAGA hats, Make America Great hats again, out there. And um, I found myself after the ceremony standing uh, next to one of these guys in a red hat. So I looked at him and I said, <laughs> pretty clear you and I have nothing in common. And we both just laughed. And uh, he said, tell me something. He said, how, uh, how, have you gotten used to all these big mukti mucks around? I said, nah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting used to it. I've only been in politics at that point less than four years. He said, you've only been in politics for four years. What did you do before that? I was in business. And he said, geez, that's really something. And we started talking and uh, actually uh, had a nice, nice conversation. And I had to go down and lay a wreath, and it was muddy, and uh, uh, I uh, uh, was waiting to go out, and I kept trying to scrape my shoes on the grass to try to get the mud off, but it, it wasn't really working. And I was about to go out, and I felt this pressure on my feet. I looked down, and there was this guy with a red hat cleaning my shoes. So I looked, and I said, what, what are you doing? He said, you can't go out looking like this. And I said, what, what is... And it, I think the thing was, he, he just said, okay, you and I are very different, but you seem like somebody that, that I, can, I can trust. And, and I think that's, that, that made the difference for me in, in my first campaign. My, my ads basically said, here's, here's who I am, told my story, and people said, yeah, I kind of like that. So it all came down to trust, fundamentally? I think it did. I think it did. My wife is here. She was. She and my and our daughters were in the, uh, the uh, the ads. And I think those are the things that sold. And you spoke about your career before you entered politics. What was it that made you want to get into public life? Well, I did my PhD in political science, and uh, uh, so I was. Al I've always been interested. And Francis and I, as we were building the business, were able to make contributions. You know realized that we needed to contribute to politicians as well as to social welfare organizations. Um, so I was always interested in, in politics. And when I uh, got to the end of my career and, and retired, um, the then governor of Pennsylvania was somebody I had su supported. And he said, how would you like to be in my cabinet? So I said, yeah, I'm, all right. I had been a Peace Corps volunteer as a kid. So I said, I'll try this. And I really loved it. And so I decided to run, and I think it was just I didn't want to be on my deathbed saying maybe I should have tried this. And there was no reason I should have expected to win, but I did. And, and that was, uh, uh, you know, really just stemmed from a, a, an interest in, in the political process and a recognition that, that all of us need to, to play a part. Moving on to your work as governor, some of your first acts, including restoring a ban on fracking in state parks and putting a moratorium on the death penalty. Can you talk us through the process of getting these through and if there was any opposition in a state that, was, um, that had a governor who was previously Republican? Oh yeah, there was a lot of opposition, but both of those didn't require legislation, so they were executive orders. I could do those things. The uh, ban on fracking in the state parks was just something I just signed a Executive but within, order. within your cabinet, did you face any opposition? No. Okay, that's good. <laughs> it's, the, the cabinet in the United States is different from the cabinet here. They're, they're not independently elected. They actually mm -hmm. were appointed by me. Um, you also fully expanded Medicaid under the ACA. How have the results of this been and what noticeable change have you seen? A couple big things. We, we actually put 720,000 Pennsylvanians, got them health insurance. So Pennsylvania's health uninsured rate is now down a little over 5%. It's the lowest it's ever been. 
Uh, the second thing is we had a big, and still do, a big opioid epidemic. People taking prescription drugs that, that are opium based uh, and that are addictive. And, and so we were losing tens of thousands of Pennsylvanians each year to the opioid epidemic. Uh, expanded Medicaid because Medicaid actually uh, provides reimbursement for uh, people who are seeking treatment uh, for substance use disorder. Uh, we now have 120,000 people who are, whose providers are getting reimbursed. And, and I think that's having an, an effect. So last year was the first time we actually saw a decre decrease in the uh, uh, deaths from opium, opioid overdoses. Uh, so I think, I think that's made a bit more people are insured, more people have access, to fewer people who are locked into their jobs in Pennsylvania. And we have more people who uh, can get treatment for substance use disorder. And then my final question before we move to the audience is about your launch of the It's On Us PA campaign to expand awareness of sexual assault. Can you tell us a bit about this campaign and again the effect that you've seen it have so far? Yes, the, uh, that, that was started, the It's On Us was uh, aimed at preventing uh, campus sexual violence and it was started by the Obama administration and Pennsylvania was the first state to sign up. Uh, and we give uh, a lot of grants each year to universities in Pennsylvania to address the issue. They, they apply for it, and there are between 30 and 40 universities each, each year who get funding for this uh, to do things specific to their campuses to, to address the, the issue of campus sexual violence. So we're now in our fourth, third year, third year, I guess, uh, starting our fourth year next year. Uh, and uh, I think it's made a, a, a difference. Uh, we've created uh, legislation uh, to make it more likely that people rep will report sexual violence, uh, instances of sexual violence. Uh, we've done things to protect people who uh, uh, will report this. For example, uh, if there's been some underage drinking, uh, we hold harmless, say, if, if you're calling to report uh, sexual violence, you will, not, you'll, you will not be charged with anything uh, to do with, with breaking some other law like drinking. Uh, or drugs. Uh, and so I think uh, our campuses are, are safer. We still have work to do, but, but I think Pennsylvania has done a pretty good job of, of actually making it clear that, that when you're at university, uh, we want you to be free to study, not to worry about uh, your safety or well being. Thank you. We will open up to the audience for questions now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come to you, and please stand up while asking your question. And could we start with the member in the black top on the second row? Thanks a lot for coming out today. Sure, thank you. So my question is, I know that part of your initial campaign for governor back in 2014, I believe it was, was <coughs> about raising a minimum wage in Pennsylvania. But till today, I believe that still has not been accomplished in full. So my question is, getting elected is one thing, but actually passing common sense progressive legislation is another. What are the obstacles? What have you faced in your own experience with this specifically? I, th I think there's, there's an ideological obstacle uh, uh, objection to, to the minimum wage that the market, the free market would, would market forces would actually uh, increase it. So uh, as a result, Pennsylvania is still at the federal minimum wage, which is $7.25. There is no state in the eastern part of the country. All of our surrounding states are high, even West Virginia is higher than Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, I have called to raise the minimum wage in each of my budget speeches, the one I gave a week and a half ago, I called for us to go to $15, starting at $12 up to $15. Um, there was a, uh, a deal that passed through the Senate, a compromise, uh, that got us to $9.50, which was better than $7.25, but it wasn't what I wanted. But I was willing to go along with that, uh, under, with the understanding that I would come back and ask again for $12 to $15. That failed in the House, again, because of ideological reasons. Uh, again, I came back asking for 12 to 15. So I, I think there is, there's appetite to, to do something about that. There's another thing with the minimum wage. In the United States, uh, in all but eight states, the minimum wage has uh, two tiers. One is for those who get tips, and then the, those who don't get tips. Uh, and uh, that tends to be a, a very degrading uh, thing. The, the tipped minimum wage is $2.83. Uh, and the idea 
theory behind it is that, that you, you get tips, but, but it tends to be a, a, a very degrading thing. And so I'm, I'm not only for raising the minimum wage, but I'm for eliminating the tipped minimum wage as well. So I'll keep trying. Uh, again, I have a Republican Senate and Republican majority in the House, so it's not like I'm dealing with a, a similar party. Yeah. Could we go to the member in the middle row over there with the, <coughs> the, it, with the blonde hair? Actually, building off of that, I am from Arkansas, and in a couple of more conservative states, we've actually seen ballot initiatives around things like minimum wages passed in a conservative state, but then the politicians aren't still able to carry that mantle. So how can you marry that idea of really winning with the progressive agenda in a state where it can win, but not when a, you put a politician's face to it? That's a really great question. The, in Pennsylvania, the polling suggests that actually the overwhelming majority of Pennsylvanians support an increase in the minimum wage. And uh, as you know, I, I think uh, in, in Arkansas and every other state, certain key leaders in, in leadership positions can do all kinds of things to thwart legislation from ever getting to a vote. If minimum wage came up for a vote, even in a Republican-dominated House and Senate, it would pass overwhelmingly. But uh, the right committee chair or the person in the speaker's chair can, can make the calendar or the committee <coughs> schedule go in such a way that those things just never come up for a vote. And I think that's, that's what, what would happen even with a, with a referendum. We have the votes. We have the, the people who would, uh, the, the, the electors, the voters support it. Um, and it's one of the challenges of democracy that, that uh, in an effort to, to make sure that we don't overload institutions of democracy uh, that we create uh, some, some real barriers to actually doing the people's will. I think the minimum wage in Pennsylvania would be uh, something that uh, w we, we should do something about. So what I'm doing is, is actually trying to, to get more Democrats into, more progressives into the state legislature. Thank you. Could we go to the member in the, re with the, in the red top over there? Hi, uh, thanks Hi. for the talk. Uh, that was a really enlightening presentation of, of progressivism that I hadn't heard before. And uh, just for the record, we're not related, right? That was very nice. <laughs> I appreciate the very nice comments. Um, my question's about uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. So um, in the recent New York Times Daily podcast, um, they interviewed some uh, labor leaders uh, from Pennsylvania representing uh, 60,000 Pennsylvanians who said, um, if Bernie is the nominee or if uh, Elizabeth Warren is the nominee, they'll either sit out the election or vote for Trump not because they like Trump, but because they represent people whose livelihoods are hinged on, on fracking, which both Warren and Sanders are calling for a ban on. Um, how, how do you convince Pennsylvanians that climate change is important and something to think about? And also, um, you know, what, one thing that's said about, about um, a transition to a green economy is we'll retrain you. And a lot of people, <coughs> excuse me, think that's like, you know, 15 year shingles. It's, a, it's you know, not actually gonna happen. So you. how do you convince them that, you know, there's a brighter future with the green economy. Yeah, and I'm in a tough position. Um, Pennsylvania uh, actually is the number two natural gas producing state in the United States, second only to Texas, and about to become number, number one. So I am a strong, I consider myself a strong environmentalist, uh, and, I, and fracking is banned in the eastern part of the state, not just on state parklands, but every in, in the Delaware River Basin. Um, but it was going on when I got into the, into the, the uh, uh, this current position, uh, and I've allowed it to, and I haven't tried to, to, to stop it. Uh, I have uh, done things to, to make uh, uh, us a more rigorous adherent to, to environmental standards. Um, I joined the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a cap and trade system that had been in place in the Northeast for many years, and Pennsylvania had never joined. Um, and at the same time, uh, I have uh, shut pipelines down, um, find I think the historic $30 million on one pipeline company that wasn't doing it right. So I'm, I'm in this sort of middle position where the extreme environmentalists don't like my position because I'm not on it for a ban on fracking. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the extremes on the gas industry don't like me because I actually want to hold them to account <laughs> to, a, to a high standard. Uh, so I, I think the, the, uh, and, and that puts me into an interesting position with, with people who are natural, should be natural allies. 
uh, some, sometimes uh, labor leaders are upset with me because they're concerned I'm about to veto a bill that they think is really a big deal on, on creating another cracker plant. Um, and uh, the environmentalists, sometimes extreme environmentalists, don't like me because of what, what uh, I, I believe, say, you know, I think fracking, uh, we, we can do it right. Uh, so I, I'm serving uh, no person's land here. I, I'm not sure that, that um, uh, I, I can do a great thing. If you'll notice that I think the New York Times was part of a podcast that the lieutenant governor was on, I was not. And uh, uh, so I, I, I try to steer that, that fine line uh, between Sill and Shrib this year, trying to, to do the right thing by Pennsylvania. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's right by both environmentalists and by labor, sometimes it's wrong by both. Uh, but I think that's what politics are. You, uh, one of the nice things about being a politician for only five years now is I, I, I'm not trying to do anything special. I can be who I am and, and, and follow through on what I think, regardless of what the conventional wisdom might be. Could we go to the member in the very back row over there with the glasses? Thank you, Governor Wolf. Um, hey. I'm a graduate student here and I study corruption. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the relationship between corruption and trust in government, which is, I'm interested to hear you um, speaking so, so much about. So I'm curious how you think corruption plays a role in, uh, in a lot of ways, corroding trust in government in the United States. Uh, both criminalized corruption, but also corruption sort of in the form of lobbying, um, and what you think, what you in Pennsylvania may be doing to help fix that, and what we might need to do on a national level. Yeah, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, deign to, to challenge anything, to, but, but uh, in reading a lot of people, like Lawrence Lessig, for example, when you talk about corruption in, in the United States, much of it is legal, uh, like campaign finance, uh, is, is really, Pennsylvania has no limits on what you can contribute to a political campaign. You have to, uh, you know, uh, open up the, uh, it has to be transparent, but you don't have to report the contribution until after the, well after the fact. Um, and that's legal. You, you can take uh, members of the state House of Representatives out to dinner, and that's completely legal, but it's, it's corrupt. Uh, and I think, I think, it's, it's not so much a matter of dealing with the legal uh, niceties of, of corruption, it's actually doing what's right. So uh, I have played by the, the rules of the game that exist in Pennsylvania, but where I can, I've changed them. So my very first day in office, I established a gift ban. That's never been done before. Uh, people deserve a de minimis kind of thing, $25 or less, we're not even gonna bother. I said, zero. And I make a big deal of it when I go for a radio interview, someone gives me a, a bottle of water, I give them a dollar, which is more than that bottle actually costs. Um, and it's not, not because I'm, I, I'm, you know, uh, I'm a goody two-shoes, it's just because I just wanna make a point. And I think we have to, to make that, that point wherever possible. And I, and I believe we ought to have campaign finance reform, which is why I mentioned it in my, my talk here. Um, I don't think there's a lot of quid pro quo out there. I think people do, for the most part, stay within the rules. The problem in the United States is that the rules allow for, for uh, bad, bad activity. Uh, and uh, while it doesn't come up to the legal definition of, of corruption, uh, it leads to the same distorted outcomes. And, and I think that's what we've got to get away from. Could we go to the member in the back over there, at the end of the row? <coughs> Hi. Hi, my name is Abigail. I'm a Pennsylvanian, so thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, Where are you from? I'm from Philly. Oh. Just graduated from Penn in the spring, um, and now I'm here doing my master's. Um, I have a question about financing the progressive agenda. Um, how do you reconcile taking profits from the fracking industry, for example, for example the um, Marcellus Legacy Fund, and investing that within like sustainable infrastructure projects? Yeah, that's a good, good, good question. There's a big controversy in Pennsylvania. I, I have, we're the only state without a severance tax, it's called. Um, every other state that produ produces uh, anything or extracts any natural resources from the ground takes a cut uh, and then uses it presumably for some public good. Pennsylvania has never done that. I think there might have been a, 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 a severance tax back in the coal days in the 1920s for a few years, but I think the coal industry put a, a, an end to that. 
Uh, as a result, when, when we're now cleaning up as the, the coal industry, acid mine runoff and things like that, taxpayers are having to come up with the, with the bill. So uh, I propose something that, that uh, uh, neither extreme really likes, but it, it is to say, okay, let's, by the way, an extraction tax is something that the gas industry embeds in the products that they sell. So whenever someone in Pennsylvania fills up their car with <coughs> gasoline, they're paying an extraction tax. Now they're paying it to Texas and Louisiana and Alaska. The only place they're not paying it to is Pennsylvania because we don't extract, we don't collect that tax. There's a small impact fee that one of my predecessors put into place, but it's fairly modest and it doesn't go to most parts of Pennsylvania, just where the gas is extracted. Um, so I proposed uh, a moderate, modest, I thought, uh, severance tax that would raise about $300 million a year on top of the impact fee, which raises about $120 million. Would still be less than Texas. But if you took that $300 million and present valued it, uh, say 20 years uh, at 5%, it would come to about $4.5 billion. And one of the things that's happening right now in Pennsylvania is, is with climate change all over the world, we have a lot of microclimatic events like flooding in local areas. The federal government has a threshold of I think $18 million before it, it actually intervenes and sends money to people whose homes have been devastated by floods. We have toxic schools. We have uh, many counties that have inadequate broadband uh, coverage. Uh, there are a lot of things that people need in local areas. So my thought was take this severance tax, 300 million, present value at four and a half billion dollars, would take four years to raise that in the capital markets uh, and use that exclusively to, to uh, send out to the local areas. And it has upset, again, some people who really don't like the idea that we would be taking money from, from the gas industry. And also obviously the gas industry doesn't like it. So it's one, one of those things that, that again, I, I've sort of in the middle of not pleasing either, either extreme uh, uh, all that much, but I think it would be a good thing for, for Pennsylvania. Uh, and it's one of those things that, that actually does enjoy broad support in Pennsylvania, uh, not unanimous, but broad support, uh, but it's just not allowed to come up for a vote because the conservative speaker of the house really doesn't want any severance tax. He thinks that would be a terrible thing. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think it would be a good thing for Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know, in the United States, one of the worst things you can do if you're in state government and to talk to local government is they hate things like unfunded mandates. This is a funded non-mandate. This is, you tell me what your problem is, here's some money. And, and I think it would be a, a really useful thing because again, Pennsylvanians are already paying that tax. We're just not paying it to ourselves. So let's pay it to ourselves. I think the concern would be that if you do it the way I'm talking about, it creates a dependency for 20 years on an industry that a lot of people don't think we ought to be dependent on. So it's an it's interesting debate. Could we go to the member in the back over there? Uh, hi, uh, hi, I'm James. I'm not a Pennsylvanian, but I go to school at Swarthmore College. So well, that's, that, you're almost a Pennsylvanian. Half the year. Um, and I was just wondering, you mentioned the book, uh, What's the Matter with Kansas, which has kind of hung around for a couple of decades in progressive discourse. And one of the critiques of that book from the right is that it takes these kind of cultural or social concerns of a lot of voters, and you know, the voters who flip Kansas, for example, um, and dismisses them as kind of immaterial. Um, do you see any way around that for progressives to kind of, you know, not necessarily, you're probably never going to agree with a lot of these voters, but to at least work around those differences and create pol politics where you... Yeah, I don't, that? uh, that's a good, uh, we were talking earlier, um, Isaiah Berlin, I think was the founder of Wolfson College, uh, was uh, really, an amazing, he died in the 1990s, a remarkable political philosopher, and, and he, he was, talked about, you know, human, beings, uh, the, the life is, is a matter of, of dealing with incommensurable ends. There is no right answer. Uh, and, and I think the, 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 the idea is that we somehow just have to make a decision. So I might not agree with you, but that shouldn't keep me from respecting you for, for what you believe. I have my opinion, I have my belief, and I think I have good reasons for arguing my, my, my case. Um, but I, I have to recognize and respect that, that you might not share those ideas. Uh, and I think that's, that's where we have to end up. So I, I don't, I think that's why I tried to cite, um, you know, there's some folks who, who blame 
progressives for just being so arrogant that, that uh, they look at what's the matter with Kansas and, and folks in Kansas are fine uh, with the disagreement. What they're not fine with is somebody looking down their nose at them. Uh, and so I'm, I'm trying to say that, that we shouldn't do that. We, we should have full respect, but we ought to have enough confidence in what we're pushing and supporting to be able to look you in the eye and say, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, but I think you're wrong. And you should be able to look at me and say, okay, I think you're wrong, but, but uh, I, I, I'm willing to respect you anyway. Uh, American politics, politics in the world these days, I think needs to get away from these sort of ad hominem uh, <coughs> arguments and, and uh, condescending uh, debates and, and get back to sort of, as far as I know, uh, what I believe is, is right and here's why I believe this. And if, if you tell me something that, that is, is different, I'll be interested in knowing why you think that. I might not be convinced, but I'd be interested in knowing. And I think that's the way Democrat, that's the way democracy is supposed to work. And I think we ought to get back to that. Could we go to the member in the middle over there? Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so in 2018, when you were running your race, I, I'm a Texan, so I was focused completely on the 2018 Senate race. And right after that result, even though um, Beto lost, there was still talk about maybe Texas turning purple, Texas might turn blue. And in 2019, Virginia went, made the transformation from a red state to a blue state. So do you see your progressive ideas helping Pennsylvania turn from a swing state to a dependable blue state, or? That's a great question. I'm not sure. I mean, I, again, I'm, I've only been in politics for five years. Apparently, I'm the most popular politician in Pennsylvania, but I'm not sure what, what good that does anybody. Uh, and, and I'm not sure that, that it come the 2020 election, if, if I'm going around and asked to, to, to speak on behalf of whoever the Democratic nominee is, uh, that that's going to be a helper or, or, or not. Presumably, it'll be some, some help. Um, I think that the thing that, that, that we can do as progressives is look at, at some of the mechanics. So I'm, I'm working very hard to raise money for people who are running for the state senate and the state house uh, who are progressives. I think that's, that's really important. Uh, I think it's important to, to try to set an example, say that, that progressives uh, are people you can trust. Um, but. But I think it, it's, it's gonna take some, some hard work. That Virginia flipped because a lot of people did a lot of hard work. Texas being better almost won, but not quite, um, uh, by working really, really hard. Um, and you know, the same year, 2018, your governor was reelected. Uh, and uh, he's a very conservative guy. We have time for one final question. Could we go to the member in the first row? Thank you. Uh, my question, like being Russian, I'm really interested in your elections. So <laughs> the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I've the, heard. The question is about current primaries because uh, it's a lot of progressive agenda going on, and uh, a lot, it may be a lot of unexpected results for many people and. Uh, since you talked a lot about communicating your ideas to, to others, what's in your opinion, what makes or breaks candidate in terms of communication their agenda to potential voters? Is, or, and is it different for, in, is communication differ if it's for democratic voters or like voters in general on the national level? Well, to the second question, I think, I think it ap applies to all voters. The first part, I'm, I, we apparently have not done a very good job yet because there's nobody who's sort of emerged from the, from the pack. So, voters are out there still considering, uh, and, and there hasn't been a break. Usually by this point, there's a, a break uh, toward one of, uh, or a small group of candidates. Everybody seems to be sort of in the same mix right now. So I'm, I'm not sure uh, how this, this plays out. Um, the, the, uh, uh, we haven't done, and, and I'm not sure that this is the candidates or the, the system, the, the party has sort of done a, a really kind of a weird debate uh, strategy. And then we had some of the election counting problems or in, in Iowa. Uh, so there's some, some issues that get to the heart of at least one of my three criteria, the competence. 
that the people can be back there forgiven for scratching their heads saying, I'm not sure I want to turn the country over to, to you lot. Um, but I, I think um, people in the United States are ready for, for a change. And, and I, I think uh, there is a growing disenchantment with the direction that, that we're, we're heading. Uh, but uh, I say this as a lifelong Democrat, we have been very good at snatching defeat from the jaws of victory before, and, and uh, you know, that, that may happen again. Great, thank you so much. That's unfortunately all we have time for today, but please join me in thanking Governor Wolf. Thank you.